thankful that you're patient and you're kind and you're generous with your time. You're generous with everything that you are. And I ask you to bless our service tonight. We're walking through this book not for the purpose of just adding information to the museum of our memory. But Lord, we want this to change the way we live, the way we look at the world, the way we look at you, the way we look at ourselves. And I thank you for those who have chosen to be here tonight. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 30 and the first 19 verses are the only undated of the seven messages of the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel covers 22 years. He didn't just sit down and write it all in one afternoon. It's 22 years. So basically this is his life's work. There are seven dated messages or prophecies in the book of Ezekiel and the first 19 chapter or verses of chapter 30 are not included in a date now when we get to verse number 20 there's a date and these are not these don't run concurrent okay these are these are separate messages and we're not uh, sure exactly in this chapter how long there was between the first 19 verses and the last few verses of it because the first part of it is undated what we have in chapter 30 is a continuation of a preemptive verbal strike against Egypt. Now, Egypt's still a, uh, still a nation tonight. Um, this, uh, this was a warning against not only Egypt as it stood in the days of Ezekiel, but some of her allies. You remember last week we looked at, you know, the, the crocodile that was dragged out of the river and, and fish were attached to its scales. It was kind of a weird thing. Those were her allies. And so not only Egypt, who was the big croc in the Nile River, but those that were allied with Egypt against Israel specifically were dragged out and they were, uh, they were dealt with in judgment. Every nation that's mentioned in the Bible that was judged what was the sole purpose of their judgment? There was a common factor for all of it. Remember what it was? The what? Boom. Their relationship to Israel. I don't care where they were located in the Mediterranean basin. If they had a bad relationship with Israel, the Lord had a bad relationship with them. Now that's a pattern that is still in play tonight. Um, Nebuchadnezzar was the dictator of Babylon. He was, uh, he was a warrior. He was, uh, surprisingly enough, he was chosen to be an agent of the Lord's hand against several nations. And he was not a godly man. He was, he was a killer. He was a brutal killer. And he had um, a lot of military power behind him. He was the, the China of his day, the Russia of his day, the United States of his day. Nobody dared raise a finger against Babylon. And so we have, we have a list of targeted people. Some are big, some are little, didn't matter. If they had done something harmful to God's people, they were on the list. And the scripture calls Israel the apple of God's eye. You've, you've heard that term. And the word apple means pupil. So Israel is the pupil. And if you get a baby or an animal or something that's, that's thrashing around your face, what's the first thing you want to protect? Your eyes. You cover your eyes. And very, very protective of our eyes. God tonight... March the 18th, 2018, is extremely protective of Israel, even, even now. Egypt is one of the oldest civilizations on earth. It's in North Africa. Um, they have historically served as, as the world's, one of the world's most vile wombs of false religion, false worship, uh, idolatry. Their idolatry was injected into the veins of the Jewish families before they were ever a nation. Israel wasn't a nation in Egypt. They were just a bunch of related people. And uh, they didn't have any laws. Egypt's laws were their laws. They had no system of jurisprudence. Egypt's system of jurisprudence was theirs. Actually, they didn't have a religion. 
Egypt's religions had been adopted by these people. And uh, so Israel, you remember when they were brought out after the, the ten plagues or miracles, um, Moses goes up in the mountain to get the law, and the Lord is starting to weld them together into a nation because a nation needs laws. That's one of the primary uh, aspects of a nation is a national law. And so the Lord gave them ten. Ten. Put them on tablets about that big, just about that tall, and they were almost square, little little bitty. They, they weren't the Charlton Heston <laughs> great big saloon doors, you know. There weren't anything like that. And so Moses goes up in the mountain, and the Lord with his own finger wrote these ten laws. These were extruded from his own character. You don't kill because I don't kill. You don't lie because I don't lie. You don't put anything before me because I don't put anything before me. And so these were just extrusions of his own character that he abbreviated to these, uh, to these five what we call universal unchanging commandments that we know as the Ten Commandments. Later on, he added more. He added more to the point where they're wound up to be 613 statutes in the Law of Moses. And... Uh, when Moses was coming down out of the mountain with these little tablets in his hand, he hears a party going on, and it doesn't sound like people screaming and hollering because they're getting beat, and it doesn't sound like people screaming and hollering because they're beating somebody. It just sounds like a party, and he goes down. They're naked. They're running around this bull calf, Apis. It was made out of gold, and the gold came from the earrings and the jewelry that the Egyptians gave to the Jews as payment to leave you know the Lord said I'm going to bring out with a high hand and he did and so they're they're recreating what they were exposed to in Egypt so we've got an Egyptian party going on it was an orgy around the bull god Apis and of course Moses got angry and threw these things down and broke them and, and you know the story so idolatry was deeply embedded in the sinews of the Jewish people and it got injected into their sinews while they were in Egypt for 430 years well Egypt also as uh, the, the Jews got out of Egypt and they were finally escorted into their land of promise it was an 11 day journey from Ramesses to the southern border of their their promised land 11 days and because of their sin that 11 days got turned into 40 years. And you recall when they elected a committee, one guy from each of the 12 tribes, and there were 12 of them that went over, and they were, they were sort of fact-checking God for 40 days, making sure that God told them the truth. And when they got back, they all voted, except for two guys, it was 10 to 2, we can't do this. There's just, just the people are big. They just, they're just they're da 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 yada 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 yada. It was all we can't we can't we can't we can't, and the Lord said, okay. You searched out the land for forty days, so I'm going to sign one year for one day. Congratulations, that's a bad deal, and so everybody twenty and under, basically, uh, or twenty and older rather, were walked to death. This was a forty year death march. It's in the Negev. If you've seen the, uh, the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba to the north of Egypt, I'm sure you've seen there's, there's the Red Sea, and then there, there are two fingers of water that form a, a big V. And you've got Aqaba and the, uh, the, the Red Sea. And this part of property right here, this land, which is about 22,000 square miles, it goes from the, the bottom of these two bodies of water up to the coast of the Mediterranean Ocean. And it's just this big V-shaped property. That's the Negev. That's where they walked for 40 years. And if we had the capacity and probably the desire, you could go into the Negev with equipment and you could probably find millions of bones that are buried and have been desiccated in that dry. It's a perfect place to, to preserve uh, bodies and things like that because of the lack of, of moisture. So as e Egypt always kind of had a snotty big brother attitude toward Israel. 
they, they never respected them. And there were times when Israel would come to Egypt and say, look, we're, we're in some trouble here and we're being attacked. Would you come and help us? And whatever Pharaoh was on the throne, yeah, 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 we'll be there. Well, they'd come down and give a half-hearted effort and then go back home. And so they left them out to dry. We'd call it throwing them under the bus. They did this a number of times. And um, so through the, through the years, through the centuries, Egypt has been a cancer to Israel. They've never been a friend of the Jews, never. They're not friends to the Jews tonight. And uh, they could have been, but they chose to go another way. And so for this failure to keep their word and for this failure to be a friend to these people, the Lord has included them in this, this hit list. And uh, we're talking uh, about uh, national devastation, not just these local little, uh, well, Wachula experienced some problems on Saturday night. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an entire population of people being decimated because of what they did to the Jewish people. And uh, so chapter 30, let's look at verse number 1. The word of the Lord came, un, came again unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Howl ye, woe, worth the day. Now that's an odd English phrase that just means woe is or woe to the day. There's coming a day that you don't want to see. This is, this is going to be awful. This is not going to be pretty at all, specifically for the Egyptians. And uh, so he goes on to say, now in verse number two, he says, how like a wolf. One of the things that I have found penetrating about the book of Ezekiel is, is the animated character that the Lord expected Ezekiel to become. He was told to do some things that probably embarrass us to death. Go outside and howl like a dog. How many of you would do that in your front yard? You might go, Ooh, you know, pull that off. But you talk about just full-blown animation. Uh, he, this, was, this was to be done. This stuff was to be done so people could see it. It was to attract attention. What in the world are you doing? And uh, so verse number 3 says, For the day is near. Even the day of the Lord is near. Now, that does not mean that Jesus is coming back is near. That's Anytime you see the, the term, the day of the Lord, it is when God's judgments manifest themselves in world history, that's referred to as a day of the Lord or the day of the Lord. All right? We've got some in our future. But this is not the second coming of Jesus. This is not the day of the Lord here. This is when God's pretty heavy-handed judgment is going to fall on these people. It shall be, or it's a cloudy day, it shall be the time of the heathen. And the sword shall come upon Egypt, and great pain shall be in Ethiopia. Now we're looking at some of the um, associates, some of these other nations. Now we're basically in Africa here. This is in, in North Africa specifically. Ethiopia is Cush. It, uh, it is called today the Sudan. And so if you look on your map, you look at Africa, uh, you, you'll see the Sudan. This is what we're talking about. Uh, the Cushites, uh, it was also called Nubia in the scripture. And so these people are, what, whatever's going to happen to Egypt is going to happen also to the Sudanese. And if you'll notice, tonight, every nation that we're going to be talking about is in the 1040 window. This window is 10 degrees north to 40 degrees north of the equator. And if you will, you will follow these, these uh, parameters on your globe or on a world map. You will see this is tens and tens of thousands of square miles from Africa to Asia. And in this body of land right here that we're going to be talking about, basically where these lands are tonight, the world's poorest people live. They live on about $1.11 a day. There's more starvation, there's more disease, there's more war. Uh, this is the womb of more false religions than any other place on earth. Anytime there's a vacuum of God's word, there's an influx of this kind of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's densely populated, and 
incredibly densely populated. I, I cannot answer that. I don't know. Could be. I've just, I've just not looked into, into that aspect of it. Good question. So the Lord's going to come on the Sudanese where the slain shall fall in Egypt and they shall take away her multitude. Now this is not talking about people. This is talking about her possessions. One of the main things that drove war was to steal your stuff. We start running out of stuff, so we come over and we beat you up and we steal your stuff. Egypt was an incredibly wealthy culture. And uh, so they, they were going to be, their pockets were going to be picked. All this stuff was going to be stolen from them. And her foundations shall be broken down. We're talking about the economic foundations and the cultural foundations of, uh, of Egypt were going to be destroyed. And so when you, when you take all the stuff, when you empty all the banks, you empty all the savings and loans, there's nothing left. You know, your stock market crashes. We've experienced that a, a few times. Uh, the, the first time, I, I doubt anybody was here to see it in 1929. It was planned, by the way. Um, we had a stock market crash just a, a few years ago, which it was a minor one compared to the one in 29. But, um, you know, when, you're, when your financial foundations fall out from under your nation, um, you're in some serious trouble. So, verse number 3, Ethiopia, Libya, and Lydia, and all the mingled people. Now, this, this term, mingled people, is referring to people that lived in the African Delta that had been hired by Egypt to serve as mercenaries. They had no investment in Egyptian culture they just made money being their warriors. And there are mercenaries today. You know, men just hire themselves out for the highest bidder, and, and they'll, they'll shoot anybody for the, for the right amount of, uh, of money. And so all of these, these three nations in verse number 5 now, these three nations <coughs> excuse me, are in Africa, and they have provided these, these mingled people to uh, help do the fighting. Verse number 5 says, And... Chub. This is actually a city in contemporary Mauritania, and it was it's called the, the Mauritania Arab Republic, and so it would eventually become an Arab nation uh, in in our day, and so we're talking about now the uh, Chub, which is Mauritania. You can, again, you can find that on your map tonight. And the men of the land that is in league. Now, the men of the land that is in league. What we're talking about here, there were Jews that lived in Jerusalem that when they got the word that Nebuchadnezzar was on the way, they got scared. They took their families and they moved to Egypt, thinking that Big Brother would take care of us. The prophets, there were, there were a couple of prophets that said, do not leave Jerusalem, stay here. Well, they didn't. They were running from the sword. But guess what they ran into? It's like the guy that, that leaves his house, you know, because the bear's in the house, and he runs outside and runs into the lion. That's exactly what's happened here. Uh, the sword's going to find them. The sword's going to follow them down into Egypt. And so verse number 5 says that these Jews, and, and the word in league means these were the covenant people, okay? The, the league is the covenant uh, that the Lord had with them. They shall fall by the sword. Thus saith the Lord. This phrase, thus saith the Lord, is mentioned three times in chapter 30. You'll find it in verse 2, thus saith the Lord God. You'll find it in verse 6, thus saith the Lord. You'll find it in verse number 10, thus saith the Lord. It emphasizes the fact that Ezekiel is not speaking out of retribution or anger of his own heart. The Lord is giving Ezekiel word for word what he wants him to tell the Jewish people. All right. Verse number six. Thus saith the Lord, they also that uphold Egypt shall fall. Those, those that uh, are in league with her, 
those that are associated with her in their uh, attacks against Jerusalem, that up holy Egypt shall fall, and the pride of her power shall come down from the tower of Syene. Now, this is modern Aswan. You've heard of the Aswan Dam? Uh, this is in, this is, actually, it's in upper Egypt, which when you're looking at a map, it's kind of odd. Lower Egypt is up top. That's where the delta flows out into the Mediterranean. They call that lower Egypt. And then come the other way, that's upper. And I, I would just say it's the other way around, but, but it's not, yeah. So, uh, yeah, probably. Well, that, that could be. And so uh, this is, in other words, from, from Dan to Beersheba, if we were talking about from, from Maine to California, this is, this is going to be a nationally encompassing devastation. And so uh, the Tower of, As uh, of Syene, that is uh, modern Aswan, which is in upper Egypt, which is in lower Egypt. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, I don't know how to say it. Uh, but shall fall in it by the sword, saith the Lord God. So we're talking about military invasion. Verse number 7. And they shall be desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate. So you've got desolate countries. And it's like the Lord is saying, you think they're desolate? Why do you see what I do to you? You think they're poor. You think they're devastated. Just, just hold on. And her city shall be in the midst of the cities that are wasted. And here's the purpose of it. And they shall know that I am the Lord. There's coming a day. When every human being on earth will know he is the Lord. Yeah. And, and sadly enough, we talked about this a little bit this morning. People should know that he is the Lord by virtue of the gospel being spread around the world. People should know that, but they don't. And even where, where the gospel is being preached on a regular basis, there are hard-hearted, stubborn people in this world that just do not believe the Bible. They just don't. Stephen Hawking was one of them. Did not believe the Bible. <sighs> yeah, well, he's got it now. Yeah. If that man had gotten saved and, you know, directed that energy and that intelligence to apologetics... Uh, but as far as we know, as far as we know, hopefully before he died, he got his heart right with the Lord, but we don't know that. Yes, sir. Right. Well, there is one thing about the Jews. Uh, they, have, they have maintained their racial identity for the most part. Now, there's been a lot of intermingling, and in you're right about that. There's been a lot of intermarriage, but there's a, uh, one of the real strong parts of their law is to keep their, because they look at Gentiles as dogs, you know. Right. Right. Well, you've always you've always got those. You know, there's always those that are going to do what they're not supposed to do, and, and you're exactly right about that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And for the most part, they have. Now, good point. Verse number. Where are we? Verse uh, number eight. They'll know that I am the Lord when I have set a fire in Egypt and when all her helpers shall be destroyed. In that day, when Egypt is on fire and people are laying in the streets and you're stepping in blood to get out of town, 
messengers shall go forth from me in ships. And the word ships is the word skiff. And these skiffs were made out of bulrushes. These were not rowboats like we know. They were, they were rowboats, but they were made out of, yeah, they were made out of, uh, of bulrushes. It was like uh, reeds. And there would be messengers that would get out of Egypt and paddle up the Nile River as far as they could go. And they're called cataracts. And these cataracts are kind of like waterfalls. And they would take these boats as far as they could go up the Nile. And they would, they, they would just tell this horrible news that Egypt has been destroyed. That Egypt is on fire. And so these messengers would go forth in ships to make the careless Ethiopians afraid. And great pain shall come upon them as in the day of Egypt. For lo, it cometh. So Ethiopia uh, or Sudanese. They get the message, whoa, 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 you mean Egypt's on fire? Why? Nebuchadnezzar came down there. Well, guess who'd been buddy-buddy with Egypt? The Sudanese. And so they're like, oh, my word. Now, the word careless means scared. They got the message that Egypt's on fire. Nebuchadnezzar has destroyed them. We're probably next, you know, because there's no way we're going to be able to do battle with them. Verse 10, again, thus saith the Lord God. Will also make the multitude of Egypt to cease by the hand of Nebuchadrezzar. Notice the spelling. That is actually the correct spelling of his name, King of Babylon. He and his people with him, the terrible of the nations. This guy was the brutal slaughterer. He was like the Vikings. Everybody was scared to death of the Vikings because of what they'd do to you. They'd fillet you alive, they'd do all this stuff. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar was one of these guys. He could, he could kill you in a way that would make you want to die, you know. Shall be brought to destroy the land, and they shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. Now, when Egypt came in, or when Babylon came into Egypt, one of the things that, uh, that these people would do, they would, just, they would cut off and destroy your capability of feeding yourself. They would cut down your fruit trees. They would destroy your crops. They would tear everything up. So when they left, you didn't have anything to eat. And so that's one of the reasons that famine and, and starvation was such a common factor in wars in these times because these men didn't leave anything left to eat. So uh, verse number, where are we now? 12. I will make the rivers dry. Now, this is not talking about the Nile River. It's talking about these, you know, the irrigation canals that we talked about last week. The Babylonians would come in, and they would, they would destroy the canal system so you can't water your crops anymore. He said, and sell the land into the hand of the wicked, and I will make the land waste, and all that is therein by the hand of strangers, I, the Lord, have spoken it. So he's going to destroy the land agriculturally. This is some pretty devastating stuff. And, and why did the Lord do all of this? He said, you'll know that I'm God. When I'm through with you, you will know. You will, you will not have any question that God did this. Now, normally when you look at devastation and death, do you think, oh, this is the handiwork of God? You know? So we're talking about a side of God. To be honest with you, I don't think that America has seen yet. Have you ever seen this side of God? Just this absolute, brutal, omnipotent uh, destruction of, of an entire civilization. We've never seen this, at least in, in my lifetime. Uh, verse number 13, again, thus saith the Lord God, I will destroy the idols. Now, Egypt was famous for its idolatry. At one time, we know that, it, that Egypt had a catalog of 12 hundred idols they had they had gods for everything they had a god for cabbages and they had a god for sheep and they had a god for getting up in the morning and they had a god for going to bed at night and they had a god of clothing and they had a god of 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 reproduction they had a god for everything and uh it's funny ezekiel every time in the book of ezekiel you see the word idols that's not the word he used now it was translated in 1611 as idols but the word he used was dung pellet. 
I love that. All right, now you just take that down the rabbit hole. That's exactly what he thought. And that's what God thinks of. You say, well, that's just awful to think about that. That's what God thinks about this. All right. So he said, I will destroy their dung pellets and I will cause their images to cease out of Noph. Now, Noph is Memphis, not Tennessee. And it was the capital of Middle Egypt. You've got You've got Upper Egypt, Lower uh, Middle Egypt, and Lower Egypt, and this was one of the major, major cities in uh, in Central Egypt. And there shall be no more a prince of the land of Egypt. And what verse number thirteen is talking about? Uh, there was a civil war between Hophra, Pharaoh Hophra, and a guy named Amasis. And Amasis wanted Hoffer's job. And so there was this civil war for a while. And while the civil war was going on, the throne was abandoned. And there was no prince. And that's exactly. Uh, now this, this, this was written before this civil war broke out. And so when you read this prior to, you're like, well, what are you talking about? And then when it's all over, you're like, oh, that's exactly what he's talking about. And so there, there would not be a prince in the land, according to verse number 13 now. I will put a fear in the land of Egypt, and I will make Pathros. Now, this is the city of Thebes. This is in southern Egypt, and it was, it was the chief city of southern Egypt. So he's hitting population centers. It'd be like, I will hit Chicago, and I will hit New York. And I will devastate Los Angeles. He's, he's not saying, I'm going to come down there and I'm going to mash all over Lemon Grove. And then I'm going to walk on over, you know. He didn't, he's not talking about these, these minor little uh, spots in the road. He's talking about some major population centers here. I will make Pathros desolate and, I, and will set fire in zone. Now zone is uh, it's, it's the place where Israel lived when they were in Egypt. This is some pretty good agricultural area here. And will execute judgments in no. Now, actually, verse number 14, uh, Goshen is what zone is. And uh, verse 14 talks about no, and that's, a, that's another name for the city of Thebes. Verse number... 15, I will pour my fury upon sin. Now, that's not bad behavior, but uh, sin is Pelusium, and it's in the northeast corner of Egypt, and uh, the strength of Egypt, and the, here's the strength of Egypt means the key. Sin was like, uh, where's a, a, a military headquarters here in the United States? That if you were going to attack the country, you would not want to go there. Uh, okay, yeah, you, you know, if you're you're going to attack Florida, I'd suggest you not go to MacDill and and start your foolishness. This uh, this the strength of Egypt means the key. So if you if you could get through sin, if you could get through Pelusium, you'd pick the lock, and everything else was pretty much population based and agricultural based and business and government but this was this was the military uh, center here which was the strength of Egypt and I will cut off the multitude of no and again this is Thebes which is about 400 miles south of Cairo uh, Assyria destroyed this by the way in 663 BC verse number 16 oh by the way let me read you something talking about these I uh, the idolatry. Uh, got a little bit of an article by a gentleman named John Joshua Mark. He's the co-founder and the editor of Ancient History Encyclopedia. Got some really tremendous information about ancient cultures. And so here's what he says. To the Egyptians, life on earth was only one aspect of an eternal journey. The soul was immortal and was only inhabiting a body on this physical plane for a short time. At death, one would meet with judgment in the hall of truth and, if justified, would move on to an eternal paradise known as the field of reeds, which was a mirror image of one's life on earth. 
Once one had reached paradise, one could live peaceably in the company of those who had loved what one had loved while on earth, including one's pets, in the same neighborhood, by the same stream, beneath the very same trees, one thought had uh, been lost at death. This eternal life, however, was only available to those who had lived well and in accordance with the will of the gods and in the most perfect place conducive to such a goal, the land of Egypt. This was the theology of the Egyptians. That's really pretty modern, isn't it? Do the best you can. Be sweet to your neighbors. Go to church. Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So there, there's nothing new about this particular theology. Now, uh, verse number 16. I will set fire in Egypt. Sin shall have great pain. And no shall be rent asunder. And Nof shall have distresses daily. Which means that they were so weak militarily that these attacks are going to be carried out in the daytime. These soldiers will just walk through town casually. And it's just going to be a... You remember London in 1944? Germany bombed them every night every night and it just didn't seem like they were going to survive and uh, one old man you know just rallied uh, I love what one of his political enemies said about him on one particular occasion um, he said Winston Churchill has rallied the English language and sent it off to war and the, the RAF the Royal Air Force had just a few planes and they did an unbelievably incredible job on the German Luftwaffe. Uh, and so this is kind of what we're looking at here. These cities are just going to be devastated. The young men of Avon. And Avon is, uh, is a place called Heliopolis. What does that sound like? Helio. Sun. Okay, this was, uh, this Avon or Heliopolis was, uh, it's up in the north. And it means the father of the gods. Egypt worshipped the sun. And that's exactly why the Lord had the temple facing the east. Because if, as you look toward, if it's facing the east, let's say that this is, this is the front door of the temple. We're facing uh, west as it's facing east. Guess what your back is to? Your back is to the sun. And so the Egyptians, their chief god was the sun. And so uh, Avon was Heliopolis, or the, uh, the father of the gods. This was uh, one of the real centers of, of uh, sun worship, basically. And of Pi-Beseth, this is a town that we know as Bubastis. And it's in lower Egypt, and... Uh, it was near, and this won't mean anything to you, but geographically it was near a branch of the Nile River called the, uh, the Pelusiac Branch or the Pelusiac Canal. And they worshiped a cat-headed god. And his name was, I don't know if I can even say this, Pasht, P-A-S-H-T. And so you've got some people in the, in the country that worship the sun. That was, that was the big deal. And then these local deities, some people worshiped cats. Uh, some people worshipped dogs. Yep. Some of them worshipped vultures. I mean, uh, it was a very, uh, and it's called animism, you know, when, when people worship this nature, uh, kind of Wicca sort of a, a thing here in our country. And so, um, they shall fall by the sword, and these cities shall go into captivity. And to Hophanes. This is near Pelusium, and uh, that's a lady's name, by the way. Look at 1 Kings chapter 11. First Kings 11, look at verse number 19. Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh. 
Hadad was one of the Jewish kings. So that he gave him to wife the sister of his own wife, the sister of Topanese. It's the same, same woman. And so going back to Ezekiel, this is the city of the queen. Tehophanes was the city. This was the, uh, oh, let's see. I don't know if we have anything like it here in the United States. Sort of the, um, well, uh, up in the northeast part of the country. What, what's the name of that really famous place where all the rich people live? Martha's Vineyard. It's kind of like Martha's Vineyard. Uh, you know, you weren't welcome there if you weren't, you know, this or you had some, uh, some pretty high connections. Also, the day shall be darkened when I shall break there the yokes of Egypt and the pomp of her strength shall cease in her. As for her, a cloud shall cover her and her daughters shall go into captivity. One of the things that, again, nations would do, they would, they would come into your town and they'd take your women. And you can only imagine what a group of soldiers who've been on the road for months, would do to a bunch of women, and that's exactly what they did. Thus will I execute judgments in Egypt, and they shall know that I am the Lord. There's that phrase again. The whole purpose of this was to, for them to know that he was the Lord. Now we get into verse number 20, and verse number 20, we have a date. And the date is April the 29th, 587 B.C., verse 20. It came to pass in the 11th year, this is in the 11th year of Ezekiel's captivity. In the first month, in the seventh day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And when Babylon attacked Jerusalem, Pharaoh Hophra did come. But he got his brisket handed to him. And he limped and whined back to Egypt. Uh, there's break number one. I have broken the arm of the king of Egypt. And lo, it shall not be bound up to be healed to put a roller to bind it. And the word roller is our word splint. Said this, this arm is going to be so badly broken, it won't even be splinted. He'll never be able to use this arm again. To make it strong to hold the sword, he'll never. In other words, Egypt was going to be broken and would never again be a military power. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and will break his arms, plural. You remember the Civil War? It's all about. Well, the Pharaoh was defeated in that, and so there's break number two. So this poor guy can't catch a break except in his arms. So the Lord has broken both of his arms. He will never again be what he was militarily. Egypt was going to descend into the nations of no account. They would never again be what they were, which was one of the great military powers of the world. And even tonight, they're not. So he will break his arms as strong and that which was broken. And I will cause the sword to fall out of his hand. He's, he's done militarily. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and will disperse them through the countries. Did you know this happened? There was, a, there was a dispersion of the Egyptians for 40 years. They were, they were dispersed. Now, here's kind of the odd thing about it. There is no record of this in the Egyptian library. None. Yeah. <laughs> um, they just they didn't like to talk about their defeats. You know, they were very braggadocious about what they could do and what they did do and all this kind of stuff. But uh, now verse number 24, I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon. This guy was a beast. And put my sword in his hand, but I will break Pharaoh's arms and he shall groan before him with the groanings of a deadly wounded man. This actually happened. Hophra is dragged before Nebuchadnezzar. And he's, at, he's crushed. He is a defeated man. And so as he, he's, he's mortally wounded nationally. And he comes before uh, 
Nebuchadnezzar, verse number 25, I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, and the arms of Pharaoh shall fall down, and they shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall stretch it out upon the land of Egypt. Now, I, again, one of the, uh, just one of the, uh, the amazing things, you would think that God will always use a pure vessel. He'll always use a godly person. He'll always use somebody that's walking in league and in synchronization with him. Not so. As a matter of fact, this is why he chose this guy. The Lord needed to do something kind of bad. But here's the thing. God doesn't do bad things. Now, from this side of the tapestry, it looks completely random and it looks like everything is out of control. But on the top side of the tapestry, the Lord is he's crocheting history into a beautiful tapestry of himself. And sometimes God has to do things that are not on our side of the tapestry pleasant. It's just like this morning, uh, you know, when uh, Bertrand Russell said, it's humane to threaten people with torment of an eternal nature. He said, that's just, that's inhumane what Jesus did. Well, from this side of the tapestry, you know, that's the conclusion that human beings come to. God is wicked. He's mean. He's vile. He's all of these things. Because if, if God was a God of love, would people be starving to death worldwide? If God was a God of love, would all these people be dying in these explosions and attacks and all that kind of stuff? Well, don't blame our decisions on God. Do what? Yeah, that's, that's what we've chosen to do. Um, well, there are two kinds of evil in the world, and, and we get these confused. There's natural evil, and there's moral evil. Now, natural evil, uh, floods, tornadoes, earthquakes, fires, these things kill people every year by the thousands. Um, those are caused by moral evil. Now, understand what I'm fixing to tell you. In the Garden of Eden, man had one law, one, and he broke it, and he became a moral criminal. When you break a law, you become a felon, right? Adam was a felon that affected his DNA, which affected us. Now, we chose to become a moral criminal. Along with moral evil, comes a collapse of the physical system as well so that the earth itself groans and travails like a woman that's having a baby and the Lord said immediately upon this new legal atmosphere in the Garden of Eden where everything volunteered oranges volunteered and pomegranates volunteered and, and collard greens and mustard greens uh, everything good to eat just volunteered guess there guess what there was none of in the Garden of Eden or on the earth as far as we know Dog fennels and weeds and, and all this stuff, sand spurs. and all, There was none of that. The very fact that there's a sand spur on your property is proof that there's moral evil in this world. That is, that's, what, that's what life morphs into when it's out of God's will. That which is useless and damaging and hurtful. And so uh, moral evil produces natural evil. God had nothing to do with it. As a matter of fact, God is the one that said, don't do this. Because the moment you do this, everything is going to change. And it does, it kind of makes me scratch my head. It'd be like if I took a gun and shot my toe off and blamed you, you know, well, you, you should have done, you know, it's my fault. So here we are, verse number 26. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them among the countries and they shall know that I am the Lord. But isn't it sad that this is what it took? You know, it took the devastation of their country. It took uh, oh, the deaths of tens of thousands of their citizens. And 
Scripture says that they will never again be what they were. And bless your heart, they haven't been. It's just, it's been an amazing thing that Ezekiel was that far ahead. Uh, well, the Lord was, and he just used Ezekiel as his mouthpiece. Jamie? Ezekiel sat down here and he was writing about all this. It's witness. Uh, and yet he is a prisoner of war of this king, this. Yep. This Nebuchadnezzar, yeah. And he, and he, he told the Jews, y'all just sit still. Yeah, don't move. Don't, I'm telling you. It, it's kind of like you remember what, Jurassic Park and that T-Rex. Uh, as long as you were still, T-Rex couldn't see you. But when you moved, you know, he, he was coming to you. And, uh, but they didn't. They got all antsy and jumped up and moved down into Egypt and ran right into the Babylonian lion down there. And took their life. Yes, ma'am. Ethiopian eunuch. Yeah. As far as we know, no. Off the top of my head, I could not tell you, but I don't know of any that went that went into that part. Most of them went up into the, the what we know as Europe, and but they, they weren't allowed to go into Asia. Paul wanted to go into what we would know as China, but the Holy Spirit said nope. And I, to this day, I don't understand that. But He wouldn't let him go east. He sent him west, and the gospel has always moved west, and that's how we got it. We're a gullible species. We are a gullible species. You're exactly right. That's true. I, I find a great deal of comfort, especially now, in the fact that we are Israel's ally. I find a great deal of comfort in my heart. Uh, do what? Yes, yes. We certainly have, and I'm grateful for that. Yeah. And again, I'll transfer the message that our Jewish guide, thank your people for being our friend, because if America was not our friend, our enemies would just consume us. But they know that there is a big brother behind the curtain that if they do anything to us, we're on the way. They know that. And so he said, tell your people thank you. And so thank you for that. But, uh, now, that this brought me a lot of encouragement when David said that. All right. Y'all ready to go to the house? Thank y'all for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll be here Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Then next Sunday night, we're in chapter 31. And uh, so good to, good to see. Kids, God bless y'all. Did y'all understand what we talked about tonight? You taking notes? What? Oh, you're, oh, Braddock says his notes are up here. And he's patting his head. There you go. All right. Well, that's terrific. I'd like to see your notes. That would be, yeah, somebody may be listening exactly right. Well, God bless you guys. Thank y'all. This is, uh, this is pretty cool. All right. Yeah, yeah. All right. We've got a quick leadership meeting right after. I'll give you a little bit of information, and uh, I'm going to let you go. So thank you for coming tonight. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the covert and the harbor that you are. We can sail our life into the harbor of the Lord Jesus Christ and we're protected and 
we're grateful that even a country can do this. And um, I can't speak for all Americans, but I'm glad that we're friends of your people. I'm glad that we are allies of the nation of Israel, and, and I pray that we always will be. And I, I thank you for your goodness. Thank you for those who've turned out tonight to be here. They've done this voluntarily. They were not coerced. They came because they wanted to show them favor as a result of that decision in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.